those, uh, those words from Liz Loeb really speak to my heart. Um, Liz uh, is one of the directors at Interfaith Power and Light, an organization that works on environmental justice here in the Twin Cities statewide organization, I think so. Um, but it's that, that feeling, that feeling of being connected to all, being connected to the source that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, how do we get there? How do we get to that space? How do we remember that connection that we have with everything? And one of the absolute best ways to do this is through spiritual practice. So that's what I wanna to talk to you today about. Specifically, what is it? Why is it important? How do you do it? And maybe even how often should you do it? So let's break it down. But first we need a definition of spirituality, a word that some of us embrace and maybe some of us are like, hmm, feely feely stuff over there. So I'm gonna offer a couple of definitions maybe to help you out. The University of Minnesota offers this. Spirituality is a broad concept with room for many perspectives. In general, it, it includes a sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves, and it typically involves a search for meaning in life. As such, it is a universal human experience, something that touches us all. Something that touches us all. People may describe a spiritual experience as sacred or transcendent, or simply as a deep sense of aliveness and interconnectedness. Now my own definition of spirituality is that it is the nature or value of your relationship with everything that is beyond the self. This includes our ancestors and those yet to be born. This includes those you have connecting details with and those you don't. This includes all living things. This includes the elements of fire, earth, water, and air, all of the energy around us that moves beyond us, among us, and within us. In Unitarian Universalism, we call this the interdependent web of existence. Using that framework, it's also your connection, right, to all living things, to all of those creatures that we share this planet with, to that stardust that we came from. It's your relationship to all that is or was or will be, to all that is known and unknown, to infinity, infinity and omnipresence. It's your connection to that spark where it all began, to which it continues ever expanding, ever expanding, ever expanding across the universe. To be a spiritual being is to have awareness of those relationships and those connections. Now our spirituality as individuals is shaped and expressed in our beliefs, in our faith, in our religion, in our experiences, and in our curiosity. It is where our great hopes are born, where dreams are seated, where compassion resides. It's also where our deepest sorrow and grief are because spirituality is all about our relationships of what is within, among, and beyond us. Because of that, it's also where love grows. All humans are spiritual beings. All humans are spiritual beings because all humans have a relationship or have an awareness of their relationship with everything outside of themselves. Our lives are as spiritual as they are physical or intellectual or emotional, maybe even more. French philosopher Pierre Tihard de Chardin is credited with saying, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. This is to say that we are all born into this interconnected web that expands infinitely beyond us, but we are limited to our own experience due to the limits of our own physical existence. 
So we are all spiritual beings, just like we are all physical, intellectual, and emotional beings. And just like that, you cannot take away those parts of your being. You cannot not be a spiritual person. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that you are the most spiritually expressive being, right? Just because you don't run marathons doesn't mean that you're not a physical being, correct? You still are a physical being. Uh, just because you're not the most emotionally expressive person doesn't mean that I don't have emotions. Those of you that aren't emotionally expressive, please remind people around you that yes, you do have emotions, just don't express them well or all the time. It's something I'm working on. Right, our expressions and our experiences of physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual, they vary greatly, as greatly as our fingerprints do, but they cannot be denied, any one of them, as making up a full spectrum of what it is to be human. Knowing that spirituality is an undeniable part of our existence, we can then look at it with the same values that we put on our physical being, our intellectual being, and our emotional being. That is, we can nurture it for the betterment of our being, and because spirituality concerns our relationship with that which is beyond us, as nurturing it for the betterment of the vast web in which we dwell. And this is where spiritual practice comes in. Spiritual practice is any exercise we engage in with the intention of nurturing our spiritual existence. Intention, underline, bold in my script, is a necessary component of spiritual practice. You can't have spiritual practice without intention. You might have an unintentional spiritual experience blindsiding you on your walk in the woods. You might even have a life-changing spiritual awakening without intention. Those things happen sometimes. But for spiritual practice, you have to have intention, a clear intention. That's what it's all about. And what is the intention? The intention is simply to bring awareness to our connections to that which is among and beyond us and within us. The intention is not to be a better person or smarter or become enlightened. For spiritual practice to be truly effective, the intention is just to practice being aware of those connections, of the present moment, of life beyond the self, of the larger threads of the web that run through you going to the far reaches of the universe and being pulled even further by that dark matter that just keeps pulling and pulling us further out. So that's what spiritual practice is. So why should we engage in it? Well, the side effects are great, really. Now, as I mentioned, it could make you smarter it could make you more balanced. It could lead you to some enlightened experience. Not necessarily will do anything, but it could do those things, pretty good side effects. Spiritual practice can also reduce your stress, reduce pain, anger. It can improve memory function, can lower your blood pressure. It can invite you to being a more patient, present, and compassionate person. It allows you a clearer path to forgiveness and acceptance of yourself and others. It reduces fear and feelings of helplessness, loneliness, and isolation. It's an effective tool in treating addiction, mental and physical health conditions as part of a larger care plan. And if you want to go broader, you can look at some of the communal effects of spiritual practice. Spiritual practice has been shown to reduce anger and violence by revealing our connections into that larger belonging to one another. And if you want to go global on a big scale, we could postulate that spiritual practice engaged 
on a global scale could probably end poverty, hunger, war, hate, oppression, fascism, probably a lot of other human-made harm if we were all trained at an early age to engage it as a daily practice, right? If those connections were always revealed to us, how much differently would we treat one another? So on a meta scale, spiritual practice could save the world. That's all. <laughs> or at least save humanity for itself. I always caution people to say, oh, we're, when they say we're killing the planet, and I'm like, the planet will be fine. It's us that, you know, we're ruining things for ourselves and for other creatures, but the planet will survive. So we could at least save ourselves from ourselves and maybe some other creatures along the way. That's huge. And that's the reason we all gather to do whatever types of spiritual practice we do on Sunday mornings or Saturday evenings or Friday afternoons, right, to engage with others in this communal spiritual practice of having a service together, of centering ourselves together. We turn our thoughts to that what is, which is larger than us, where we acknowledge the reality that it could all be so much better if we kept acknowledging the reality of our connections to one another. But, we, and maybe we feel that moment, right, on Sunday mornings um, or, or other times that you might gather with others, you allow yourself to feel it then. But it's not always easy to keep that feeling alive. Other forms of our existence need their time too. Our spiritual needs often get pushed aside in favor of our physical, intellectual, and emotional needs that keep our lives so very busy. This despite the fact that we know that spiritual practice is good for us. We know this, right? We all know, oh yeah, meditating is really good for you, but I don't have time for that. So let's talk about having time for that. Let's talk about ways to do spiritual practice and maybe how you can engage it easy access first of all the most important thing to note about spiritual practice is that it is practice again bold underline in my script practice you just practice it the first thing that you need to remind yourself of with spiritual practice is that there is no goal of mastery. You do not need to aspire to the spiritual equivalent of six pack abs, <laughs> right? In fact, it's just the obvious. It won't work if you do that. Spiritual practice requires you to let go of notions of perfectionism and achievement, which can be really hard for us, right? Especially those of us in a Western, white supremacy type culture where achievement and all of those kinds of things are just built into us, goal, goal, goal. You gotta set that aside. Now, regarding your practice then, if you're not perfecting it and you're paying attention to it, it's gonna seem awkward, unpredictable. It doesn't turn out like you thought it would. If that happens, congratulations, you've done it. <laughs> Life is awkward, unpredictable, and doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would. So if your practice feels like that, well, then you've truly tapped in, right? Secondly, about spiritual practice, there's no box to check that you're done. You're never done, it's practice. Practice, 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 it never ends. And um, that's kind of the same with other forms of exercising that we do for our other forms of existence, right? Physical exercise, jogging, running, walking. You don't get to check that box off, whatever it is that you do physically, to say, oh, well, I took a walk, I'm done walking now, right? Spiritual practice is the same way. <laughs> 
I also like this example. You might get a vaccination, but that doesn't mean that you skip your physical or quit taking medication. You know, if you go to a retreat center, you might have a great spiritually expansive time there for the few days that you're there, but that doesn't mean that you're, you're done, right? The number one thing you need to do to engage spiritual practice is to put those words PRACTICE in capital letters, bold, underlined. Don't get hung up thinking that you need to be like the Dalai Lama or Yoda. Don't get hung up on it feeling awkward or like you're not doing it right. It's worth it just for the mere sake of doing it and you're doing it for the fact that it honors your own existence and worth and that of the worth of life around you. So let's look at a couple of common spiritual practices that, that we've probably all heard of. The two most engaged practices are meditation and prayer. Both of those practices involve slowing down, paying attention to what's going on right now. With prayer, we focus on what's going on with us and with others, and we name our feelings around it, and we send those thoughts out to the universe. Now, you may be sitting there saying to yourself, Laura has used that word prayer twice now, three times now, in the assembly hall. What is she talking about? <laughs> Don't get stuck in those thoughts, <laughs> please. You might be saying, so what or who are they praying to? I have two answers for that. First, what, concerning me, if I'm praying, if you're like, who is she praying to? What's going on there? One, I don't know. <laughs> I want to be clear on that. I don't know. That's not the point. <laughs> because the second point is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me that I don't know. I should also add that it shouldn't be your concern who or what anyone else is praying to because it's their spiritual practice, right? We all have different beliefs when it comes to stuff, and some of us like to pray even if we don't know who or what we are praying to. Even if as a professional minister, my prayers still sound rambly and awkward whenever I do them. That doesn't matter. Because what's important is that I'm just naming the things that are close to my heart, the things that need to be lifted up. I am revealing those connections to what is within, among, and beyond me, and that matters. Why am I praying? Again, I don't know. Because it can relieve stress, because it can help ground me, because it can improve my health, because maybe it saves the world by deepening my connections to the bigger realm of existence, therefore changing my actions, and the actions of those around me if I'm doing a communal prayer, save the world, yada, yada, yada. I mean, I always say prayer at its minimum just names the feelings that you need to get out. And at its most, it could save the world. Who knows? Now, prayer can be a personal thing or a communal thing, like saying a word of gratitude before a meal. It can be short or rambling like mine. It can be formal or familiar, recited, made up, silent, spoken, or even sung. But it isn't the practice that everyone prefers. Though it is a common one that we might be invited into, right? When you go to other places, when you're at a wedding somewhere, or maybe a funeral service, at a congregation that isn't your own, sometimes prayers come up. So I invite you to make peace with it so that you can be at peace when that happens there instead of thinking, who are they praying to? What's going on? Why does this matter? Don't get stuck there. Now, if you think prayer is kind of elusive and hard to understand, let me introduce you to meditation, which is equally so. This is truly a thoughtless act. <laughs> <coughs> Right? It's, let me, actually, it's not even an act because you're trying to do nothing. <laughs> Just so hard. <laughs> Meditation is the practice of being in the present moment and setting all your thoughts aside, but not really. And it's way harder than it sounds. 
there are many kinds of meditation, kind of like prayer. There's silent, there's walking, there's chanting, there's guided meditations. YouTube has a ton of these things, and there's the Calm app, and there's all kinds of things that you can use, Headspace that has all these meditation <coughs> apps that I recommend. Um, mindfulness is also a form of meditation. I'm going to talk a little bit about more of that in a minute. Now you can meditate sitting, laying in grass, standing by a tree, floating in the water. You can meditate with others or alone. But my favorite meditation, and I say favorite because it's the one that I'm able to do um, without those thoughts keep coming in and then before I know it, I'm like working on my grocery list and writing a sermon in my head or you know, planning a conversation with somebody in my head, and it's five minutes down the road, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I'm supposed to be meditating, and then I go back to it, and then I get frustrated, which isn't bad, right? It's practice, so you let go of that. But still, I want to be centered, and I want to, and I want to experience this moment. So one of the things that I do is I engage in kind of a mindful senses meditation, and I'm going to actually invite you all that, to join me in that now. Uh, for those of you watching online, this would be a good time to turn yourself away from the computer screen. If you have a window, that's preferred. Um, but any scene that's not your computer screen would be good. But the first thing that I want to invite you all to do is get in a relaxed position where you're seated, right? Take a deep breath, close your eyes. Just feel like the chair, that the bench is holding you, where you're seated, wherever you are. Again, another deep breath to relax. And we're going to focus on our senses. I also want to say that most of the time when I do this, I do this outside. But the first sense that you focus on is smell. And this is a really hard sense to get in touch with sometimes, so this is why I like to do it first. So just take a moment and notice what things around you you can smell, and just name them to yourself. And next, I turn my attention to what I can taste. Sometimes this is a hard one, too. But I've noticed in my meditation, it could be the stale coffee from what I was drinking earlier. Sometimes when I'm outside in the winter, I can taste that kind of metallic iciness of the ice and snow. And then move your senses to your sense of hearing. What do you hear? And then I move my attention to my sense of physical feeling. What do you feel? Where can you feel your clothes touching your body? Where do you feel air on your skin? And then I finally, I open my eyes. I invite you to open your eyes, look around. You can focus on one area nearby you. 
This works great at a window. Also, um, it's great to do again if you're outside. And just notice what you see and name what you see. This can include shapes and colors and light as well as objects. And that's it. That's a senses meditation. You can also do this while you're walking. Of course, you're not gonna close your eyes then. And then when I do it when I'm walking, <laughs> I just bounce back and forth between those things. So I'm doing my walk, I see a squirrel, I smell a pine tree, I feel the crunch of the leaves beneath my feet. You know, you just name whatever's coming up for you in your senses as you're walking. It gets kind of repetitive, but it does keep you in that mindful, centered space. And I know we think, oh, this is great in nature, but I also invite you to try it in other places. Done it on the bus and the train a few times, that's a, an experience. You really notice what's going on around you with other people. You know, do it in the mall. Uh, do it when you're at some big gathering or some big festival. So it's not just something to do in nature. We often think of spiritual practices, oh, I want to go in nature and connect with that, but let's not forget that we're connected to everybody else too, and it can do you a lot of good to spend some time just focusing on what it is to be around others when you're actually around others. So this kind of practice makes us more aware of what's going on around you in the moment. A similar uh, meditation type experience that many of you may had is a body scan where you let your focus travel through your body and just notice head to toe how every part of you is feeling. That's another way to do spiritual practice. But there are also unlimited forms of spiritual practice because you can take almost anything you're doing and look at it through a spiritual practice lens. So I'm talking about hiking, cooking, knitting, social action, uh, writing, making art, singing, dancing, all of these things you can look at through a spiritual practice lens, right? I'm a sh I, my former career is a chef, and not every time I cook, because sometimes, most of the time I'm just cooking, but if I decide that I wanna do spiritual practice as cooking, I'll pay attention to every single ingredient, thinking about where it came from, thinking about how physically it feels for me to be using my hands, one time I was making bread that had seeds in it while I was doing this, and I looked outside, and there were the birds at the feeder right there, and I just thought, oh, how connected am I with them right now? I've got this seeded bread that I'm working on, and they're out there eating seeds, and I felt really connected to them. And so, I mean, you can engage it in anything. If you really want, if you really want to use uh, spiritual practice as a way to change the world, try for a day to think of your consumerism as spiritual practice, right? Because I guarantee if you start thinking about where everything is, how it affects everything in the great web when you're out shopping, well, first of all, it's really hard to shop and do that because you're aware of how much impact you have on everything. But that's what I'm saying. Spiritual practice has a huge impact beyond just relaxing ourselves and lowering our blood pressure. Because it brings us into that right relationship. It brings us back, like that reading from Liz Loeb, takes us back to that right relationship from which we came. In closing, our spiritual nature is an innate part of our existence. We all have a spiritual existence, a connection to this larger life. Spiritual practices which engage our spiritual nature and nurture our connections to the web of all being which we are a part are great for our overall health and balance and may also have the power to save humanity from itself. All you need to do is get practicing. The end. Or is it just the beginning? I'm not sure. Blessed be and amen.